I'd now like to request uh, Professor P.J. Narayanan, uh, who will moderate this very exciting panel for the next session uh, to uh, say a few words and introduce our esteemed panelists. We have an exciting panel or exciting set of panelists. I feel so small standing here in front of all these people. Uh, and uh, I was just going to set some context, just exactly two slides. I didn't want to have any slides. But uh, actually, uh, Eric did it so well. So these points have practically been covered. I was just going to say all, all kinds of things are said about AI today as a job killer, including, you know, white collar jobs and there was scare a few years ago that university professors like us will be will go, go away with MOOCs and some AI and uh, all kinds of uh, other scares and there is even worse killer drones and killer weapons there are a bunch of people worrying about it and even go as far as saying you know under this the singularity and the age where the the Machines will control everything and we'll be just servants. Human beings will be servants to the machines. These are all scarce scenarios that are being talked about with, you know, in relation to AI and technology. And the positive things, you heard a lot of them from Eric, amplify the human potential. You know, we don't talk, we don't think twice about wearing eyeglasses when you have slight eye defect. You know, why would we have any difficulty having <coughs> some AI appliances? And, and what Eric talked about, Covering up our biases and and uh, you know blind blind spots that would be a very nice application of, of you know not not just infirmities but our infirmities in thought and help with deficiencies in the the health domain the the sleeping giant analogy couldn't be more perfect there's so much you can do and uh, you just saw you know I would like to unash unashamedly plug a little bit. The video that uh, Sri Ram showed, there was this uh, visually impaired student uh, trying to do this thing. He would take credit. He was a, he got an integrated MS from IIIT. In 2011, somebody came to us and said, uh, you know, there is this guy, he's very good. He cannot write the entrance exam. He's not allowed to write JEE. Would you do something? And we discussed at the highest level, at the governing council level, Professor Raj Reddy chair said, they said, if there is somebody who's really brilliant, we should find a way to bring him in. So we admitted him as a one-off case into the integrated MSc program, the master, MS by research in computer science. He did very well. He got a thesis in five years, and I, I just met him two days ago in <laughs> MSR. He's doing extremely well. He's probably been instrumental in starting this whole area of you know accessibility work there. There was a room of enablement where multiple ideas for the for the visually impaired were shown there. So I, I, this is a ad break for IIIT, yeah, but. So there is, and there's precision agriculture, precision medicine. You know, there's so much that AI or technology can do. Now, I just have two questions for the panel, and we'll just take, ask the panelists to, uh, to answer or talk about these things. How can AI and technology help, especially countries like India or developing nations, <coughs> where, which have unique challenges, low resources, maybe literacy problem, people are not as enabled as they should be. But, you know, technology and AI, these are also opportunities. You know, the, 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 in India, one of the examples given is we didn't have an elaborate telecom infrastructure. We didn't spend billions of dollars laying cable, uh, you know, underground cables, overground cable for telephone. So we could utilize the opportunity of mobile, mobile internet or mobile telephony so well. Similarly, what we don't have so far may not be a, you know, should not keep us back further, the technology maybe can provide better solutions for us. And so in innovation and, and uh, ideas are particularly more important in such a scenario. They can play a greater role. That's question number one. Question number two, since it's an academic research summit, what can the community, the largely represented here, the researchers and the academia, how can they in involve in a coordinated manner? I just have these two questions, very broad questions. We will. Uh, uh, request the panelists to to comment on these things or whatever they want to comment on for maybe you know three to five minutes each uh, for no particular reason we'll start from that end with uh, PPC I, I didn't introduce the panelists we have a fantastic uh, set of panelists I said I feel very small in front of them Partha Pratim Chakrabarti is the director of uh, IIT Kharagpur the largest and best IIT from where I graduated to okay so <laughs> 
<laughs> he was you know he's one of those uh, he, he did his phd in ai long time ago he used to he used to sit in grad schools in us and see these fantastic papers coming out in ai magazine from karakpur from my alma mater and he has later moved on to many other things uh, working on many other things and and leading that institution next to him is uh, the the handsome anandan who <laughs> who used to who started and heading the the he was headed the msr india lab for 10 years and then he moved on now he has come back to india with a fantastic and uh, exciting assignment uh, he is heading the wadhwani institute of ai which is precisely focused on what we are we have listed here on how to use technology and ai for social good and i, I don't <coughs> need to introduce professor raj reddy you heard him yesterday and next to him is uh, mr ajay sani is the secretary of it in the government of india he used to be the secretary of it in andhra pradesh few years ago and was part of a uh, lot of innovative it application project that you know andhra pradesh was a pioneer in applying all these and he was the brain behind it or the person who executed it he also was the officer on special duty to establish this institute so we are very close to him and i wouldn't even try to introduce Eric Horowitz, you had a great, great talk so, so far. So we will start uh, with the, with you know, views on these or other related things. Uh, we'll start with uh, Partha on that, that end. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, PJ. Uh, so uh, thank you for inviting me here. I'll just share with you the way we at IIT Kharagpur, along with several institutes, are looking at uh, use of AI for society and try to answer these questions. we have identified four social convergence themes the first theme is called signals and systems in life science and our objective in signals and systems in life science while well, many people are doing brain mapping and stuff like that we are trying to find early signals that can be detected very easily at very low cost so that we can scale this up at a very very large in a large manner I'll give you an example of a simple thing. People use skin resistance to check many things. We just took skin resistance of the two fingers and plotted it over time and looked at the similarities and differences that happen across them and we found very early signals for some diseases. So our objective here is to try and find signals and map them to systems for two things. One is healthcare obviously. for very early detection of diseases because for india you need large scale you need to scale it up and you need very low cost and very innovative stuff the second is for learning we believe that in india unless you are able to understand and transform the ability of people to learn so this is our first uh, domain in which we are focusing on and we are we are def we are using a lot of ai uh, in this domain along with the modeling and you know from the medical science cognitive science it's not ai stand alone it's all ai integrated the second is our theme which uh, eric horowitz also mentioned it's called the future of the earth so we are looking at deep geosciences along with everything on the earth system and we are trying to first solve smaller problems uh, so we Uh, purposely took up the city of varanasi because it is the prime minister's constituency and we dug 91 holes of 200 meters each and we now have a 3d subsurface map of the whole city by doing that we not only found the city by digging these holes we found archaeological evidences which are able to show that this city is 2000 years older than believed now we have this whole analysis about what we want to do for this city in a much much better fashion than you have for anywhere else the second thing that we are working on are on platforms one is on the ground water situation of india so we are we have just mapped the whole ground water data for the last several years and we are looking at which interventions have helped where for example we are pumping in 25000 crores every year on water harvesting through the uh, rural development we found that in some states it has helped the other project that we are doing because we are in one region is using the whole of ai and data sciences for extremal climate change studies that means 
what are the events that come out, how do extremal, because climate change is affecting us and, and we have a lot of these things. And we are working with cities like Calcutta and others to build what are called urban observatories. The third project that we are working on is called food sustainability. Since we have agriculture and food sciences, everything from uh, biotechnology, agriculture, farming, post-harvest technology, packaging, transportation, logistics, to the end. And here we have this huge uh, base of information for us to study how are we going to really improve the food sustainability from production to everything else. And very recently we are now taking uh, two or three pilot projects including the whole of the Northeast. The donor ministry is, is working with us to do that. The fourth is a very interesting project because of our own country. It's called the Science and Heritage Initiative. In India, we have huge amount of heritage about human intelligence and its relation to sound, music, breath, and, and everything else. Now, we seem to have lost all that. Can we rejuvenate? Can we re-understand all that? Can we understand music from data science point of view? Can we understand? So we have, we have got sound. We've got data which shows moving sound in various ways increases arousal in the brain. So, so these are the four uh, principal thematic vehicles we are using for our study of AI for societal change. The second thing that we are doing and which answers the second question is what are we doing to bring everybody in? So we are trying to build big platforms where everybody can collaborate and work. The first one we have built is called the National Digital Library of India. This is a platform which provides free access to books, material. So all boards, including the Andhra Pradesh board, and everybody has given all their books and material to us. In about one and a half to two years, we now have 12, 13 million material there. We have 10 lakh users regularly using that. And now we are building around that, you know, so we've got collaborators, at least all institutions. PJ, your institution is also part of that. So it's, it has about 200 institutions who have contributed all their material to this. And this is a, a platform like this, which provides collaboration for which the government is providing funding. I think platforms like this are required. The second platform which we are trying to work is called the Digital Earth Initiative. And then we want to combine these two. We will be very happy to uh, you know, participate in other platforms. So I just wanted to stop here because we would like to, I would also like to hear the others speak about. Thanks. What Thanks, Pratkanandan. Yeah. <clears throat> First of all, thank you. Thank you, ACM and MSR India. You know, there's a, you know, not only did I found MSR India, I actually played a strong role in the creation of <coughs> ACM India. There's a story, story behind that. So somehow I feel like you know this uh, whole you know uh, forum uh, means something special to me. So I'm <coughs> glad to be here. Uh, so to go back to what PJN started. So I am back in India now to start this Vadwani Institute for Artificial Intelligence. And since what we are doing there pretty much answers the two questions, let me just talk about why we are doing it and how we are going about doing it. See, one of the premises of doing this is that there's a class of research uh, opportunities. But more importantly, class of opportunities to have social impact, specifically in India and other emerging uh, economies and developing economies, that requires a, you know, not the regular sort of a commercially based model of innovation and deployment, but a, but, but a little bit more of a not-for-profit uh, approach, especially related to AI for social good. Now, to a certain extent, this was the premise of uh, you know, starting the Technology for Emerging Markets Research Group in MSR India, and we learned a lot of things from doing it. But in this case, there's something uh, more recent and new that we realized. For example, I think Eric mentioned this. Uh, you know, in order for us to make sure that we address the needs of different segments, the learning that happens should include data and information about those segments. And if you look at the conditions across different parts of India, different uh, rural parts or different uh, ethnic communities or different states, they are not actually all that similar. There are many similarities, but there are many, many differences. And in fact, mainstream applications of AI that will learn at the large, typically today AI is learned through companies you know, like Google or Microsoft or Amazon or Flipkart. 
uh, in the mainstream economy, they will learn about people who are participants in that economy. But you know, the vast majority of Indians who are not you know, regular parts of that economy, information about them will actually not flow through very naturally. And so there are very good opportunities to actually look at use cases that we call our societal use cases, where we can you know, bring in information and data about those domains, those problems, be it agriculture, education, healthcare, infrastructure, whatever, and try to improve the models or at least to specialize the models to those conditions and then go back and apply them. So this is one of the reasons why you know, I undertook uh, this opportunity and you know, wanted to go about it. Now, fortunately for me, uh, Ramesh and Sunil Vadwani have endowed uh, $3 million a year for 10 years uh, you know, for us to go and do this experiment. So I have a long uh, runway. And so how are we going to go about doing it? But to, to, to do really things right, we have to do three things. One is to we have to source the problems. In other words, we have to identify the problems that we want to work on as being problems that are actually valuable to work on. I mean, at least in the beginning, you want to work on those problems, which I don't mean a low-hanging fruit, but which, for which we, we have a definite idea that if we solve these problems, it's going to make some, some lives better or some conditions better. But we don't actually know that sitting in the lab. So we're going to look at people who are well-versed in working in societal areas. Those could be government people. You know, we plan to work with a lot of government agencies, as well as you know, not-for-profits, who typically are the ones that are out there in the field trying to take care of these communities and their needs. And we will work with them very closely to identify what problems to work on. Now, that's not enough, right? A problem can be interesting, but the problem can only be solved if we have the resource to solve it. And the biggest of these resources is data. Can we actually collect the data that is needed in order to identify, you know, work on these problems? So, so we will choose those <coughs> problems you know, where we think that there is an opportunity to you know, get data or data is available already, or if not, you know, we'll be able to somehow get data. And again, we'll have to partner with these you know, execution partners in order to do that as well. And the third part is, of course, you know, doing these things actually and setting them in the lab is no good. We're going to have to dip, you know, test them in the field and refine them in deployment. These models fundamentally improve as they get used and as we start you know, expanding their scope. Once again, we'll work with these execution partners to do all of that. So the model we are thinking about is one in which we will very closely partner with organizations and agencies that know how to work in the societal domains. The unfortunate thing is, and this is the reason why many companies are not in this, one of the reasons uh, are not in this business is because it's not a uniform market. It's not a uniform segment. It varies across states, regions, districts. So we have to kind of you know, work very closely with different organizations and agencies. However, we know a number of you know, agencies, uh, and in states we know champions in the government that have a broad view. For example, Digital Green is already in about 14 different states in India, working in about 150 or so villages. They know how to work in the field, so we can use them as a place to go to and do our collaboration. Now, if we did all of this, and we are going to build a team you know, of what, about 20, 30 people in the next few years, and maybe 60, 70 people over time, there's no way we're going to uh, do all of this by ourselves. So one of the things that we are planning to do right from the beginning is not only do our own research, but also make this an open hub for anybody and everybody who wants to come and solve these problems. So everything we do will be, will as much as possible, be on open source. We'll work with open platform. But in addition, we also invite pretty much anyone who says, you know, I want to work on AI for social good in India. Come and spend time with us. You know, we will give you a space to hang out, work with us. But we'll, more importantly, for those of you in academia, and I know this from my own experience as well as you know, talking to many of you, uh, reaching out to the end user community through these deployment agencies is actually as hard as it is for anybody. So because we are planning to build a network of such organizations, you know, we want you to leverage that. You work with us, work through us, work by side, it doesn't really matter. So we wanted to become a place where people would come and you know, either join us and work with us or just you know, use our resources and contacts to go to, go to get things done. And a last you know, important thing, are two aspects to this. One is in order for us to really successfully do this, we need to build a data ecosystem. There is no data ecosystem for social good, when I, by which I mean that there is no obvious place to take all the data, put it, there's no guaranteed curation, devalid, validation, and sharing. Because we are going to have to do this, we are going to try to look to you know, work with all of you to create a data ecosystem for social good in India. And you know, in terms of putting it on Azure or other platforms, as well as you know, you know, systematically creating an architecture for data sharing and such. Secondly, and this is a you know, separate topic that's come up a number of times, even, and this is not specifically relate, related to underserved communities, 
actually the need for you know trained data scientists and ai you know uh, technologists in india is is big and we don't simply have the capacity to meet it when i was you know running the adobe research lab we felt that shortage we just adobe as a company simply could not find enough trained data scientists to hire leave alone you know in villages so one of the things that you know this is acm that you know i'm proposing and planning to work with all of you is let's try to create a systematic program for like a masters program in data science uh, you know that will be something that has a common core curriculum leveraging you know at, you know there's a limited number of people who know how to teach machine learning and ai you know it's, can we somehow come together and create some kind of a program <laughs> and a curriculum that can be widely distributed we have already promised university of mumbai who are our collaborators and the government of maharashtra we will enable them to do this so in fact you know to keep that promise i need your help anyway so thank you thanks Anandar. last thing there's brochures of the institute on the uh, <laughs> table please come and pick it up <laughs> thanks anandan uh, a request for sir ajreddy to so for the last 15 years i've been trying to answer the first question the area was called at that time when we started it ictd information communication technologies for development and the question is what does that mean and yesterday i presented a version of my view which was kind of thought based on a very long term perspective today i want to kind of present a short term perspective what can be done immediately today and that for which the technology exists the problem that is the big elephant in the room is digital inclusion in india about more than 500 million people cannot read and write not english read and write anything and if you add that to people that can read and write but can't understand what we call semi literate that number goes to closer to 800 billion million globally those numbers are 2 billion completely illiterate and and about 3 to 3 and a half billion semi literate the question you ask is <coughs> are they to be left out of the information revolution what can we do what are the kinds of things if i am only illiterate and i'm not willing to learn to read and write don't try to say i'm going to teach you to read and write let us assume that i'm not willing to read and write how should i help you know what can i can you do to enable these people you can't say they're stupid just because they're illiterate Rem remember 3000 years ago everybody was illiterate there was no reading and writing all this happened in the last 2 3000 years you know and so and they invented reading and writing these illiterate people actually invented reading and writing and so <laughs> so we we cannot equate literacy to intelligence and you can be completely illiterate and be brilliant and uh, so in the in that context i have i see there are about four low hanging fruit i've been bugging my friends at microsoft and other places to do them and maybe eric will do it <laughs> i'll give you my list okay the first one if i'm poor in a village and illiterate i don't have golf courses i don't go on vacations i don't have any entertainment the only entertainment i can have is a tv set fortunately that's now available the costs are reasonably low and however the only movies and entertainment i can see is my my local language that severely restricts what i can see and hear supposing and we have the technology speech to speech translation technology you you could produce dynamic real time translation not transliteration that would also be useful you could display it in english and display it in telugu and speak it because that way you by osmosis you are teaching them english a little bit also yeah, that kind of technology exists and i think we should aspire in the next 5 years or so to en enable everybody in india who is illiterate to be able to watch any movie any time anywhere Eng Eng especially english and other kinds of things and so that's the first one the that speech to speech technology 
The second one is the same thing in a slightly different application. This is the only country in the world where there are 23 official languages. And, uh, and if you go to South, they don't speak Hindi. I can't speak Hindi. I, I should, but I can understand it a little bit uh, because I escaped that, uh, that part. But, and if you go to North, they have no clue about any of the South Indian languages. And so the question of how we talk to each other is in English. And not everybody speaks English. So there's a big problem of unifying this country. And the way to do it is to invent the technology where I pick up the phone and call Dr. PJ. And I speak in Telugu, and he speaks in Malayalam. And both of us can perfectly understand each other in real time instantaneous translation of language, speech-to-speech -speech translation. It, the technology exists, can be done today. The only issue is how do we get from this to real application? No other country has this as a serious major problem than in India. The third one is uh, something lots of people would make a lot of money on. This is, we, 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 uh, Eric talked about, we all talk about dialogue systems. One of the biggest potential applications of dialogue systems is e-commerce. Amazon should be building it, they probably are, and they will release it in before we know, but what they should be able to do is any illiterate person in a village should be able to, using a smartphone, only speech only and speech, out, speech input output, no typing, nothing and have carry on a dialogue, just like I would say to my shopkeeper or my assistant, saying, buy this, this, and this. And they might say, this is too expensive, you don't have the money. You know, and so the whole dialogue that happens among people should be able to happen with, with machines as intermediary, so that I can buy anything I want and it gets delivered to my house by next morning. There are other related problems that are equally interesting. If I go to Amazon, they say, what is your bank account? I say, I don't know what a bank is. I've never been there. What do I do? I need an assistant that's more intelligent than me about banking. It may not be more intelligent than me about other things I can do, but at least about banking, to help me to set up the banking. I need an assistant that will set up my email account. I need an assistant that will go pay my bills. All kinds of things that are related the tra to the transactions that between people uh, can be done today. And if we do those dialogue systems right, in this orphan language of 22 languages of India, which Microsoft refuses to acknowledge, in spite of my bugging them <laughs> for many years, they, they are all very, very positive about it. But they say we have other big problems to solve and, and we don't have the resources. I said that's not true. You know, all, what they don't have resources is to collect the data. That's where the government comes in. They should be able to give us all the speech data in all the languages you know, so that, and you make it public uh, database. And then I, it, within, a, within a short period, Microsoft will be able to produce a dialogue system in any language. So that is the, 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 the fourth. Now the fourth one I want to talk, uh, say and then stop is non-intuitive, non uh, non uh, agricultural robotics. Basically, you say, you don't need robots. There are lots of people in India, they're willing to work, and you, know, you don't need robots at all. It turns out to be exactly wrong. I was in my village. I come from a small village. And people there don't want to work. They say, you go sit in an office, air-conditioned office, and your life is very comfortable. You want me to go and work in the field at 40 degrees centigrade or over 100 degrees Fahrenheit all day long? No way. I'm happy with what I've got, I have. I can have roti kapada makhan. I don't need any of this. Now, I don't want to work. So much so in Andhra Pradesh, which is one of the richest fertile part of the land in the south and, and the, the whole country, people are being imported from Bihar. 
okay, 1,500 miles away, to do the work in the field. It's kind of crazy, but that's, what, that's the reality. And we need to develop agricultural robotics with an air-conditioned cabin. So I, as a peasant, illiterate peasant, can sit there and do whatever has to be done, but I'm not willing to work hard in, in the 40-degree in the temperature. So those are the problems I think we really need to solve to bring digital inclusion to the 2 billion people that are not part of that community. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Reddy. Sajesani. I think January has been a very uh, interesting month for me. You know, in spite of uh, reading and uh, reading a lot, listening to many things, uh, seeing a lot of things on YouTube, I think 2017 AI was still, uh, you know, something sophisticated, something a little distant. I think for me personally, January has been the month that has sort of brought it far closer starting with uh, uh, a session with uh, Professor Raj Reddy on 12th uh, of January and then followed by a brainstorming session uh, workshop, uh, sh small workshop we did in uh, New Delhi in the presence of our Honorable Minister uh, on I think 18th or 19th and uh, once again uh, coming here today. I think what uh, this has done is to, to bring it uh, far closer and to bring home the realization that AI is, is here. AI is now. AI is not tomorrow. AI is not six months away. AI is not three years away. AI is here. It is now. The moment you, you look at it that way, I think first impressions are always going to be extremely important not just for us, but for, for everyone, anyone who is uninitiated, anyone who has only heard of it as something distant. Now, the first, very first impression, you know, the first impression, you, what you may try to make out is uh, what uh, PJN uh, referred to. Is it friend or foe? It's a very, you know, instinct, a human instinct is, is it a friend, is it a foe? It's very important for us to, to look at AI in a manner that it brings it alive very rapidly and in no uncertain terms as a friend. Much before, you know, fears sort of, <laughs> you know, get played on uh, that, that it's, it's something that is threatening or it's a foe. And the presentation that uh, Eric has made today and uh, some of the uh, reading and some of the thinking that emerged uh, in our workshop uh, a few days ago makes me believe and makes me very confident that there's a huge potential in AI. And that potential is to address the real life situations. It's not something very sophisticated or something very remote. At the end of our workshop uh, a few days back, our Honorable Minister summed it up very nicely <coughs> that we must look at AI, leveraging AI for India. We must look at AI for inclusion. We must look at AI for augmenting the human capability. I think these are some of the directions and thoughts that we are trying to carry into our policies. Now, AI for societal good, there's a huge area to, that we have to, huge journey that we have to undertake. India is an amazing place for that journey. You know, one thing that I always keep mentioning to my teams, 
is that a large spectrum, large array of unaddressed problems, whether it is in healthcare, it is in education, it is in agriculture, it is in providing livelihoods, in almost in, in providing credit. Sometimes we cannot imagine, you know, sitting in maybe other milieus, other uh, locations as to what is not yet solved, what is not yet available. So, in a way, India can actually serve as a cradle, as a, as a fabulous test bed for trying out not just AI, but all the related sets of technologies. The focus being on creating solutions, because it's, it's not creating a solution and then finding the problems that the solution fits in with. There are large number of problem areas around unsolved, underserved communities, unsolved problems, where we can actually, you know, put all of these technologies together and start creating solutions. So, language being as Professor Raj Reddy has very beautifully pointed out, language being one, you know, the barriers of language which are denying a large number of people access to a lot of information, data, knowledge, you know, services. So, many of these problems we can overcome using these, uh, the technologies that are becoming available. Augmenting the human capability. What is it that a human being, again, I think Eric's presentation brought it out very beautifully. There's so many things that humans can do with these technologies. What are, which ones are those that we can do much better? I think those are the ones that we need to concentrate on. The inclusion, you know, who all is left out? How do we use it for inclusion? How do we bring these to people who are not, who are excluded or who are uh, at a disadvantage in some way or the other? Uh, many, many ways of identifying those who are not yet included. How do we bring them in? How do we bring them as co-equals? How do we get them the benefit of all these technologies? So, in, uh, in many ways, again, inspired by uh, what Professor Raj Reddy has been, uh, you know, suggesting to us for, for now for decades, actually. I, if we go back a couple of decades, I think in, <coughs> In some parts of India, now we are able to get some, first of all, very good communications in place, able to get the concept of fiber going to the villages, fiber going to the homes. Mobiles are already in place in a large number of, almost all over the country. Recently, I think we have experimented with taking free space optics technology. Now, in some of these areas where hardly any communications had gone, and all of a sudden we have a bonanza. We, in, in deep tribal areas, yesterday, uh, in fact, Mr. Chandrabhav Naidu, speaking from Davos, interacted with villagers in some of the remotest villages in Andhra Pradesh, remote, deep in the forest, with a combination of fiber and free space optics uh, provided by uh, Google X. And all of a sudden there is a, you know, there is a test bed becoming available where many, many of these technologies can come together. They can be applied together. They can be applied to, in a situation where, uh, you know, there is, uh, it, it's, it's a different, it's one issue building on something which is already available and improving it. It's another 
completely another dimension where you know improving uh, the health outcomes in hospitals by analyzing what kind of deaths took place builds on availability of a huge amount of data <laughs> we also have a situation where there is no doctor how do we make ai applicable to that situation and probably it it will end up impacting a far larger number of people how do we make that a priority when we deal with what ai can do for india in india <coughs> so these are some of the thoughts what is it that the government can do i think we are looking at the possibility of supporting some centers of excellence that's one direction we will move in the second one which is extremely important is data we have huge data sets now with existing implementations of e governance with existing systems which transcend public and private providers and i think it's important for us to construct data sharing policies platforms marketplaces with due and very acute regard for privacy concerns because the moment you think of data sharing i think privacy is a is a serious concern fortunately we have a data protection framework and a legislation in the making very recently we had uh, consultations uh, across the country new delhi uh, hyderabad bangalore and uh, day before yesterday it was in mumbai and i think we'll be able to come up with something something good <coughs> so we need to construct these data sharing policies and bring create mechanisms by which data gets anonymized policies are in place so that you know de anonymization is not doesn't happen in a uh, unthinking manner and data can be put to to use for developing tools and services we would want to work on creating use cases and test beds where not just individual teams but you know people with different capabilities can actually come together and combine in a creative way different technologies and apply them to uh, test beds or use cases the way i have described the you know the tribal uh, uh, kind of ecosystem or some of the rural ecosystems we can also create capability through curriculum we can create capability through providing some uh, you know tool sets on a platter to colleges to schools to residential schools they they have an advantage you know an msr location may have tremendous advantage in terms of intellectual ability in terms of the tool sets some of the residential schools and colleges would have the advantage from the other end they are close to the problem sets they are close to the problem areas they understand those much much better so how do we combine these creatively how do we create curriculum and other mentoring and other resources how do we knit them together as communities that can actually start attacking problems as in in india today we have an advantage we have some strengths in in software we have strengths in design and r&d i think more than 70 75% of the top 500 technology companies have r&d design happening in india not just for india but for the world we have that capability somewhere we don't have our own design houses yet not not many of them but we have this capability we have a hardware ecosystem where we are 
starting to reclaim our share of manufacturing. The entire system is almost coming in, in place, you know, starting with assembly of mobile phones and PCB assembly and, and camera modules and one by one, bit by bit by bit, we are trying to get the entire ecosystem in place. Now, putting AI, IoT, device ecosystem and this huge availability of talent and the massive availability of unsolved problems and underserved communities, I think we can create something stupendous. As Professor C.K. Pralad used to put it very beautifully, fortune at the bottom of the pyramid. In India, if we <coughs> create solutions, and those solutions are created for actual use by people in India, especially in disadvantaged communities in rural India, then by definition we would be doing that at price points or in, you know, with processes that make these solutions almost unbeatable anywhere, anywhere in the world. I hope that we will be moving together towards that. Thank you, Ajay. Uh, I request Eric to. Yeah, it, it, it's uh, fabulous listening to um, people to my left who are far more expert in the, the interesting heterogeneous mix of culture and demographics that, that is today's India. But I'd like to hear in the domain expertise uh, and reflections. I, I was going to give more of a domain independent reflection, uh, maybe at the higher level, and just share some thoughts on the first question about AI in society. What I found in my life is that uh, the creative spark of the actual path to where the attention needs to go in developing um, one or more AI technologies with an interesting, valuable goal is not the same idea as I had when I first entered an, a domain or an area with preconceived notions. And there is such a beautiful uh, evolution of thinking when it's joint with people on the ground in a domain like healthcare, um, working with a data scientist or an AI scientist, um, starting out with just an open exploratory um, frame. Uh, I'm thinking of like uh, all the various, I was sitting here thinking about all the, the I, would, I would say, um, no compromise AI principle development at the same time as an application that was really interesting and I learned a lot from the application where there was actual valuable artifact created, whether it went big or not, or stayed small, but still had quantifiable, interesting, positive impact on a societal uh, uh, challenge problem or an insight building uh, experience. It, it typically has been starting out with just curious friendship and exploration and spending time on the ground learning. I'm thinking of uh, sitting at the Michigan Control Center at NASA, in Johnson Space Center just to find out what on earth goes on in during a space shuttle launch. This was during the 80s, the late 80s, when I was looking at time critical decisions and bounded rationality and watching the people's faces in the propulsion section with their hands on the, on the abort button on the space shuttle sitting. And I'm looking, instead of during a launch watching the shuttle, I watched the flickering light on their faces and what they were doing with the numbers. And the project we ended up building um, ended up being very different uh, in terms of, of what it was we built to assist these people from what I thought we would do. I thought we were going to be diagnosing shuttle problems and it turned out we ended up building models to guide and minimize information flow to humans to be the most relevant in time critical situations. Um, or watching a trauma care physician working with a multiple casualty situation in the emergency room, just sitting back and then talking about what went on hearing a surgeon say, when they come in and they say they can't breathe, that's really a bad sign for them being, staying alive. 
I don't know why that's the case, and then diving into the modeling. Or um, uh, working with people in education and saying, well, what happens with these people in math? These are people at CMU, actually, uh, Kurt, Ken, Ken Kerdinger and others. What happens with people in math when they get hit a concept they can't master, and what does the teacher do, and what kind of an, a, a reasoning system might help diagnose the situation in a tutoring uh, setting? Um, or sitting in the United Airlines Maintenance Operations Center looking at jet engines coming through, like pieces of meat on meat hooks, but they're engines, and they have to be diagnosed quickly and turned around. You just learn about the field, and you learn about what might make sense. So, so I was sitting here thinking about, well, how can we set up opportunities like that? I mean, I was um, very lucky to have made my way into opportunities to do that. I think Ed Feigenbaum used to say, what made AI so much fun is you get to learn about many different fields deeply. You get to sit with people and really understand, you know, back to or or um, uh, how to do mass spec in dendral. And it's it kind of exciting to sort of learn the science. But how can we set up opportunities for students through practicum style engagements where we're actually bringing people together in a way that's not like here's the spec, build a, you know, diagnose this problem, uh, it's an important one, but more like spend time in a semester in a practical project where you have to figure out what's the most valuable thing to be doing by learning a lot about the field itself uh, in, in the details. And then jumping up a higher level, I'd say that for a place like India, you said help countries like India. Um, I started thinking about some general principles. Um, the promise of doing deep offline analyses with small representative cohorts to develop more global policies that could be applied that have the properties of requiring just lightweight observations and the output being selective attention, selective investment where it most counts, where so many of these interesting opportunity areas are places where if we did X for everybody, we'd be, we'd be bankrupt. But if we figure out where to put the resources, when to put them, those kinds of problems might uh, be the type of thing in a place like India where AI systems with selective attention mechanisms and selective observation mechanisms where we work offline in detailed analyses to figure out how to do lightweight things that selectively allocate resources the way to go. That's a high level description I realize, but maybe some of you followed me. <laughs> um, the example, of, by the way, for readmissions, um, just to make it concrete, what I just said, the readmissions manager, uh, the idea was you could, you could put between three to $10,000 per patient uh, in a program if there were high risk for readmission, let's say congestive heart failure patients, revolving door style patients. If you could put it between, let's like, say, three and $10,000 in these various kinds of programs, special smart scales that look at fluid levels and engagement models, 10 days after discharge, outpatient appointment pursued, there's different kind of education packages. You could show that you could, you could actually minimize costs by keeping patients healthier and out of the hospital. But you can do the math and you realize right away there is absolutely no way you could do this for all patients. Any homogenous policy where you, ha you had to pay a few thousand dollars per patient was doomed to failure. So the trick was find the patients who are at the highest risk, or find the patients who would be most responsive to a particular program, and by being selective, the overall cost of the system went way down. And I think that that's the, I'm trying to hang some concrete on the, my, my overall comment for the kinds of analyses that might go a long way in a place like India. And then the second question, is, I'll just make a, a, couple, a comment. Um, I think that industry and academia from my experiences at Microsoft can do can go far together. We were just talking, um, we just had the, the Jim Kuros, who's the head of the, uh, the, um, the SAIS area of NSF in the United States, come visit with us at one of our directors fora the, of the kind that Anand, Anandan used to go to when he was with us. Uh, we had a meeting in D.C., so we had some Washington, D.C. officials come and talk about partnerships. And we asked in the NSF, get creative. How can we partner with you as industry, and we had a bunch of ideas. I think they're all promising and we're talking right now. Like, can we do joint challenge problems together? Like, let's define working with government and, and civil society groups, 
really interesting challenge problems and let's jointly fund them as industry and government and make them really fun and exciting and um, put out some really well-defined challenges and have the cre creative students and faculty and industry work in teams to, to, to do, you know, under deadline to come up with solutions. That's one example. The other thing is data. I really agree with this data idea. Um, there's so much incredible data locked up by governments uh, and the private sector as well. Um, Tom Khalil in, in the U.S., who uh, you probably know Tom, uh, was involved with the OSTP, the, the White House Office of Science Te and Technology Policy, when we had an OSTP in the last administration that was functioning. Uh, a little bit better than today's uh, OSTP is functioning. Uh, and um, he started making a list of data resources. One that was interesting, he said, he discovered that there were like something like, I think it was like 75 million uh, annotated pathology slides locked up in the armed forces pathology services. Like this, this is like decades of annotated material of the kind you could build a brilliant pathologist across the 40 tissue areas of the human body. But we, these are just locked up and just sitting in dark rooms. Um, and and the, that the airline, the, the, the planes flying, we first found there was a, a service. We had to pay something like some dollar and a quarter per plane we had to ping to a, to a, to a service called FlightAware. I forgot the exact price we were paying. Now, that was kind of fun because we, we ended up building an AI system that would figure out which plane to ping because it was very expensive. But I, I called Tom Khalil and I said, Tom, we, 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 we called the FAA. This information is owned by the government. I don't know how it's being paid for by this startup, but can't you just make the pipe, the fire hose available to Microsoft? We'll, we'll, put, we'll put a service up. And within a month, we had our service. Free flowing data, well oiled by a well-intentioned government official. There's a lot of data like that locked up. And I'm sure India is full of it from census been taken over the years, and it's probably, it's not doing a good job by sitting in a dark file cabinet right now, even if it's paper right now. Industry could help convert, by the way, these interesting old data sets on yellowed paper into live, dynamic, available data sets to be used for science and for innovation. I'll stop there. Thank you. So, very good views being expressed. Yeah, you, we have a question to each other, or before you I, open it up. I want to kind of put my colleagues on the spot. <laughs> You know, Eric and Sriram on one side and Ajay on the other <laughs> side. If they made up their mind today, they can create a speech-to-speech -speech translation app so that I would be having my smartphone and you'll be sitting next to me. You'll be speaking in English, I'd be speaking in Telugu. And I'd, he would be speaking in Hindi and I'd be speaking in Telugu. And we'll be having perfect conversation. It can be done today in less than six months. And the amount of effort involved, given Microsoft already has Skype translation data, they have access to Flipkart data, and they have so much more data that they can contribute. It would be fantastic to have simply an app between English and you know, any other South Indian languages, and English and Hindi, Hindi and South Indian languages. It can be done. Speech to speech, already microphone is there, image is there. You don't have to be next to me. You can be in Redmond, and we could do the same thing. But for the first time, we can just be sitting next to each other. I, I hope you'll do A commitment okay. has to be made, though. OK, we will open it to questions from the side. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Sri Ram Oh, Sri Yeah, so I. Um, uh, I, I wanted to make a, a statement about, I actually didn't know, Ajay Swani, that you were behind the uh, data protection framework document. Uh, I want to make... Uh, uh, Gopal. Go, Gopal, <laughs> Gopal. Yeah, I mean, your team, I mean, it's just yes. amazing because um, uh, the legal people in Microsoft forwarded the document to me and asked for uh, comments. And I read it, and it was really well done. You know, it was thorough, considered, balanced, and very thoughtful. So I really commend your team for putting the document together. Uh, in fact, actually, I was uh, in the same meeting that uh, uh, the director's meeting that Eric invited me to, that Jim Kuros came. We heard from uh, policymakers uh, in, in the United States about how they think about their data protection framework, which is really um, uh, 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 driven by the Fourth Amendment. Uh, 
And uh, we have had a lot of experience in our lab thinking about GDPR, which is how Europe thinks about it. And I was coming back in the plane thinking about how India would think about it. And when I read your document, I found that you combined the elements, or the Fourth Element, uh, Fourth Amendment and the GDPR, very, very well done. I mean, that's, uh, I, I recommend actually people read it, it's very well written. Now, the, the question is, is uh, uh, in some of those uh, uh, call for uh, feedback that you asked, one of the things I uh, was very intrigued about was how should we think about data use policies for research versus commercial uh, commercialization? And I just wondered what feedback you got and how you are planning to um, address that. Yeah, that was my question. I think Gopal will be able to respond. He's so in piloting that. There are certain exemptions provided. And as long as it is anonymized and doesn't uh, lead to identifying the person, it will be there will be a scope to do it. The, the data protection is primarily aimed at personally identifiable data. Any data which is personally identifiable, and then we will also be uh, categorizing certain data as sensitive personally identifiable data. So, uh, the, so based on what kind of data it is, what kind of purpose it has to be uh, used for, and uh, the consent and limitations of consent, uh, the duration for which you know that is made available, purposes, limitation of purpose, and all those principles uh, we'll be trying to build in so that it, we basically believe that it, when it's uh, personally identifiable data, it is the person who is the primary owner of that and should have a role in how that data is shared and should be able to share uh, data, uh, all financial data, for instance, with a prospective lender, but with confidence that it will be used in a responsible manner. Because that can suddenly unlock a huge area of flow-based credit. Which, which is desperately required here. So there are many solutions that will emerge only when we make the data available. But we would want to do this in a very responsible manner so that the concerns don't overwhelm you know, the, uh, the pro progress towards using technologies. Yes. Absolutely, absolutely. So we, we'll, we'll facilitate those. The lady there, yeah. Pankaj and, yeah. Go ahead. Greetings to the respected panel. 25 to 35 years from now, when we might have achieved DGI, how do you see the cultural and social fabric of our societies changing when AI might have steeped in, uh, into our lives? Like, uh, how do you see societies or people, uh, how they would look at religion, politics, culture, the way we interact with our families, the way we interact with our friends, and in the presence of our EQ-enabled um, friends, right, to an extent where some people might feel unsettled when others call their AI-enabled or EQ-enabled friends as machines because they think that now they have feelings. So uh, how do you see this kind of dynamics changing in the coming years? So, so let me make a quick comment on that, and it's an optimistic one. Um, one of my deep-seated beliefs is that as AI rises in, in, in competency, and becomes more powerful and, and potentially human-like, there'll be a rising demand for humanity. <laughs> there'll be a rising interest and value of human connection. And I see even the rise of what I call a caring economy in a world full of machines where we value human teachers more. The top mathematics teacher for a fourth grader is paid more than the top surgeons today because it's a human contact. People will always want human beings at the other end of a conversation. And I, I like to think that in a world full of machines, that will be even more amplified. I know it's a, it's a counter-cultural belief maybe in this room. You want to say something? So, so actually, one way to think about, I mean, sometimes when you want to think about the future, yeah. you can look at the past. So if you look not 25 years ago, but maybe 50 years ago, and saw what you might have said at that time about what would happen now, and then multiply that by a factor of five or something. <laughs> <laughs> you might get an answer. OK. So I, I have a small suggestion kind of thing, because I think this is a good opportunity. So first of all, it is very, very exciting <laughs> topic on AI for, uh, for public good. So I think one of the things why uh, uh, 
there's a lots of assumptions, but I'll just mention one and then propose the suggestion, uh, is that many of the researchers in India are still uh, fairly young, because after all, CS itself is relatively young in India. And I think the perspective which people like you bring to the table is very different from what I see my younger colleagues doing. They're very tied down to, rightfully so, they're building their careers in that. They're very tied down to fairly academic kind of problems, and rightfully so. And I don't think that's going to change by, by doing any of these. Then you will say Microsoft solved the problem. Microsoft will say, hey, look, I don't have the resources or people, etc." So here is a suggestion, I think, and there's other thoughts behind it. I think you guys have already, met the panelists have very rightfully laid out many of the challenges. And I think with a, just, just over a lunch, you can lay out, let's say, 10 problems and so on. <coughs> we just have one problem, right? <laughs> <laughs> No, he, he's we, want to, we want to solve Raj's problem, well, and we do, we're done. So, <laughs> no, so that's one. But Raj mentioned four, and no, no. I know his presentation was no, I will settle for one for next six months. <laughs> okay, good, good. Six, <laughs> six so months. It, we'll take that one off this list <laughs> because it's already done. But I think if some people from your uh, group of people, some people from Microsoft, some people who are in Vadwani who would be focusing on this kind of work, agree to co-guide some PhD students, I think we can find our faculty more willing to do that. Right? If you say, hey, look, here are the challenges. I, I'll fund the PhD student. Would you want to take it? I think there is going to be hesitation because that's not what they've been thinking about. But if you say, hey, look, once a fortnight, I'm willing to give uh, one week on this. And suppose we have these 8, 10 problems, and we say we will put in five PhD students or three PhD students or whatever we can do. I don't think funding is a big deal. Most of us can support that much, and if we can, that's not an issue. So I'm suggesting a concrete thing. If we can lay out a few problems, and on this side you say we are willing to co-guide on these problems, and then we find partners on this side, find PhD students. Four or five problems, four or five PhD students on each, and we have something going on. And I think it can happen, as I said, I, as being a director, I'm supposed to be solving problems and coming up with these things. And there is two other directors sitting right there. And we have Microsoft, Vadwani, uh, Raj Reddy, and the government there. I think this is clearly doable. It will be a great start. Almost within six months, we can ramp it up. Data and, uh, and some fellowships can come from data if they, if they feel like it. So, Pijan, actually, uh, Pankaj, I'm glad you mentioned it. There's something that we are already starting to do. Right now, um, in fact, today, I think, we are talking to uh, Ravi Balram in IIT Madras about uh, something like this, where we want to set up something like a satellite center, whether physical or virtual, where we will do three things. One is to help identify problems for the students to work on. The second is uh, create the pathways between uh, the researchers, both students and faculty, to our network partners. And third is, to a certain extent, uh, you know, create some funding for these kind of projects with students. So what, this is something, you know, I'm like in the process of coming up with an MOU or something, and something I, in fact, plan to talk to you. I mentioned it yesterday during dinner, as well as with the other <coughs> IIT. So I, I think, uh, I do agree, these thoughts are all good. We need to have concrete processes that would allow these type of collaborations. And to the extent, you know, we can do it, we are definitely planning to do, to reach out to every That's institution and do it. Yeah. Yeah. I think the yeah. professor had a comment. Yeah. So I believe in coming up with very concrete, deliverable, measurable grand challenges. What you said, let me restate it. Let's have a very specific goal of training 100,000 data scientists, starting to train within six months. What one institute is already on the record saying they are going to help to train a lot of data science. Why don't we say they are going to come up with the curriculum and the online lectures and everything else and all the other institutes that are represented here. Really, why this is great. I was talking about research because this is something which a lot of faculty is not doing. No, no, there, there are two so parts. So but there are, to me, yeah. Okay. Training PhDs is a long-term thing. You and everybody has been talking about growing PhD output. It hasn't happened. So we need to come up with very specific. If you want to say we'll have 100 or 1,000 PhDs coming out next year, starting next year, and if the four, three of you, you know, 
uh, or five of you, whatever, were to work on that, that would be great. Simply saying it and going away is not going to make it happen. Okay. See, we'll Hi. Uh, I actually can I very well empathize with Professor Reddy's <laughs> some of the observations he made about real problems. I run an agri-tech based e-commerce company. We go to interior India to source so raw IP output from mills. So when I was in Madhya Pradesh, the problem you mentioned about labor not being interested to do agriculture was very evident when I asked the local people why there are large fires in the local farms. And I was told that there is no manual harvesting. It's all done by mechanical harvesting. And they leave stubs for hundreds of acres. And once the harvesting is done by machinery, this is interior Madhya Pradesh. Now we would think it's a very labor available, but it's not. People are doing mechanized harvesting. And the stubs are being burnt after they are left. And so I can empathize with what you're talking about. It's not just about importing laborers from Bihar, but it's also about moving more to mechanized harvesting because of availability of consenting labor who is willing to do agriculture. So that, I think, is a great thing. But being in this field, I can throw a real problem for you. We work in the food tech industry. And for us, when we were doing R&D, I drew a lot of data-driven business problem solving. One of the problems we found is shipping a container from India to New York is cheaper than getting a container full of raw material from Batinda to Bangalore. So that's the logistic cost in India, sir. That's a real problem. And let me tell you another problem in the same direction. We supply on e-commerce, like Dr. Raj Reddy mentioned, to Horeca segment, hotels, restaurants, caterers. And believe me, some of these have in one city, they have 25 kitchens. Geographically <coughs> distributed. So we wanted to create an AI program <coughs> using geographically mapped resources, optimizing the route. But when we go to look at the Google Maps cost, it's prohibitive for us. So that's the request for the big use Bing Maps. They're free. <laughs> so, so that's I think real use case, and we can really get logistics cost to be coming down in India. That's a real business problem. Logistics cost in India, thanks to at least removing the tollways. That was a big help. But I think we are, we are a long way off in India to work on this one big lo sector, logistics. Yeah. Logistics, we'll logistics. It can use so, 10 problems. Yeah. So mindful of Eric's time, he's already late. We'll take one last question from a student. You know, did, all of them were not students, so I thought we'll allow one student question. That will be the last question, unfortunately. Hi, thank you for the panel discussion. I am Vishal from Indian Institute of Technology, Delhi. My question is very simple. That in academia, the way we work in a problem is we make a lot of assumptions on it, and then we try to solve the solution. If the solution doesn't work, we add more assumptions to it. Okay, so, but that is not the case in real world, or specifically when we work in the society. We cannot add more assumptions to it. So how are you trying to bridge up that gap, uh, specifically from Vadwani Institute? <laughs> yeah, so I think this is, Very good question. You know, this is a classic dilemma that I've dealt with as a researcher, right? we narrow the problem down to a solvable problem. <laughs> now, the way in which you do that in real world is not by narrow the conditions on the problem, but you look at what problem you want to actually solve that will have, you know, that will have uh, applicability. And you work with things that are solvable, but not from a theoretical assumption point of view, but my, both from a practical use point of view, and then expand out of it, right? So, you know, some of the things that we encountered when we were when actually working at MSR, is like in the context of uh, some of the work that Bill Thies did, right? When you narrow down what exactly, where exactly technology can help, it turned out to be very, I mean, I'm not going to go into the details of the problem. This has to do with med medication adherence and so on, right? It turned out to be very different from what you would come to it with the first, you know, in the first space, because there's a big gap between what the big problem was and what technology can do. So you start, you know, you know marrying where you can actually solve something, but at the same time, it has value. Right? And then you expand out of it. There's no, you know, there's no easy magic bullet other than that, right? But you don't kind of, you know, lose the real world in the process of reducing the problem as to something that's solvable because you have theoretical solutions. But you also want to make sure that that's worth solving at the same time. So uh, with this, we have to unfortunately end the panel. There are so many questions. I, I, I hope people can get to interact with the rest of the people. Eric has to leave, and I'm, I'm really thankful for you to, you know, if, if I pushed you too much to be on the panel, I'm sorry for that, but yeah. you made it mu worth much more worthwhile. And thank uh, Ajay, Dr. Rajadidhi, Anandan, and Partha. Uh, one uh, last comment. Okay.
Okay. Uh, you know, being with Raj Reddy in panels is risky. I've learned this long time ago. <laughs> Somebody in the panel walks away with a homework assignment. <laughs> <laughs> All I can say is that I'm glad it wasn't me. <laughs> no, it is. <laughs> you have 100,000 data scientists, man. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Let's give them it's a big hand. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> and uh, we'd like to appreciate the panelists. Uh, if you can